Hello, everybody. Welcome from my side uh, to this uh, Fleur hands-on online workshop at the Forschungszentrum Jülich here in Germany. My name is Stefan Brügel, and I'm heading the Department Quantum Theory of Materials, which is a member of the Peter Grünberg Institute and the Institute for Advanced Simulation, and feels responsible also for um, uh, the development of this open source community called Fleur. Um, I'm convinced that many of you uh, have already experienced with density function theory um, in one form or the other. Many, maybe some of you have done already density function theory calculations. Some of them, some of you may be super expert. You may come from fields like physics, chemistry, biology, mineralogy, geology, um, nanoscience, um, various uh, very wide diversity of fields. Um, uh, maybe you have heard already density have heard already density function theory lecture in your university or at your course. And uh, the mission of this uh, particular talk is basically to collect uh, to to bring you all on the, on the same footing um, and uh, getting the right nomenclature and getting you tuned to this particular workshop. You all um, oops. Um, uh, all of you probably are familiar with the Schrodinger equation, which is a wave function representation, wave function equation in, for quantum mechanics. Uh, here written in a, for the stationary state, you see the kinetic energy, the electrons uh, interacting with the potential. Um, the solution is a wave function. The wave function gives you the, the square of the wave function gives you the probability of the electron distribution. Uh, the solution is an, a, a consequence of the eigen of an eigenvalue problem with the proper boundary condition, which gives you also the energy of a particular state. Uh, that is uh, the, the quantum, uh, the Schrodinger equation is um, basically a theory which we would call uh, from first principles or in Latin ab initio. Um, as it does not make any assumptions that uh, such as empirical models or parameter fitting, it starts directly at the level of the established uh, science. Um, I'm convinced that many of you have solved this uh, Schrodinger equation, at least for one particle, maybe in one dimension or in three dimensions. Here, for example, I show you the example for the solution of the hydrogen problem where you see the square of the wave function gives you the probability, probability distribution, for example, for the S state, for the P state. The nice thing about this quantum mechanics and this Schrodinger equation, it is uh, easily uh, extendable for many electrons. You see here the um, kinetic energy of the ions. You see here the kinetic energy of the electrons. You see here the uh, interaction of the electrons with the ion. The electrons are the position of the electrons are described by small r, position of the ions by the capital R. You see here the, the electron-electron interaction, uh, the, which is uh, enriching our life or make our life complicated. And you see here the uh, repulsive Coulomb interaction of the, of the ions. Also the electron-electron interaction is repulsive. We see this in the positive sign, the electron the, the interaction of the electron with the nuclei is negative. You see this here with a negative sign. The way I have written down the equation is um, in atomic units. So you have uh, units of poor radii and the energy is given heart rate energy. And with this uh, formulation, you see two quantities I cannot scale, scale away. One is the ratio of the electron mass to the um, mass of the ions. And one is uh, the nuclear number. Um, I guess in first approximation, I remember that uh, the, the mass of the ion of the electrons is small and the mass of the uh, ions are large. Uh, therefore, in zero author kinetic approximation, I can ignore um, the, um, in, um, the kinetic energy of the ions. And uh, as soon as I ignore this, um, I know that uh, the uh, the position of the atom is a constant of motion, and in particular, the distances between atoms uh, are constant of motion of the motion, and therefore we have here actually this guarantees actually 
the spatial structure of the matter of matter, such as the co configuration of the molecule or the, the the position of the atoms in the in the crystalline solid. So basically, ion atoms, ion positions are fixed, or better, the, better, the, the difference between ion atoms uh, are fixed. We can do a perturbation theory about the adiabatic approximation or the born oppenheimer approximation. It is very crazy that, uh, or rather bizarre, that the entire matter, uh, organic, inorganic, is basically controlled by one number, which is the nuclear number. Uh, the dependence of all these properties on the nuclear number is rather bizarre, but we know the periodic table. Yeah, we have some periodicity in the different, uh, in the periodic table. And this periodicity we transfer also to the solid. The nice thing about the quantum theory, we can also give the exact solution uh, of this problem, which is the many body wave function. And the many body wave function depends on the uh, position of the electrons and parametric on the position of the stationary uh, atoms. Uh, for example, for the cobalt, uh, not for the cobalt, for the um, uh, carbon dioxide molecule, um, we have for the oxygen, we have eight electrons for carbon, six electrons for oxygen, eight electrons makes in totally 22 electrons. We have three coordinates, makes in totally 66 degrees of freedom. So we can have to, we have to represent, represent the wave function of this CO2 molecule uh, in 66 dimensions. And if you plan to resolve the, the wave function by 100 grid points in each dimension, then we have 100 to the 66 power dimension uh, grid points. And for sure, this is not a wave function which we can store. Uh, this problem has been recognized or realized already in the 30s by, uh, for example, uh, Dirac. And uh, he wrote in his paper, in general theory of quantum mechanics is now almost complete. He understand the, uh, the, uh, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole chemistry are thus completely known. Exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. soluble. And uh, we need approximate practical methods um, without too much computation. So this is this. This was 30, the 30s, and we are still working on this. Um, one example where you can do an, uh, one example of an approximate solution is using a variation ansatz for the unknown wave functions. That means you take the Rayleigh-Ritz variational principle, and you basically take a wave function, which is maybe a, a good ansatz due to a strong physical uh, intuition. And then you uh, take this strong physical intuition and you construct a wave function, which, which is flexible parameter-wise, curvature-wise, uh, functional-wise. And then you make an ansatz for this wave function and minimize this ansatz, these parameters or the these expressions with respect uh, to the wave function, with res respect to these parameters and you find the optimal, the best possible wave function in the set which is allowed. And if the, the wave function matches exactly uh, the ground state wave function, we have to ground, we find the ground state energy. Otherwise, we stay above the ground state energy. And we know, of course, that each wave function on the Hamiltonian depends on this configurations of the atoms, but we do not uh, go into it in detail uh, today. And we keep it in mind. A very famous uh, ansatz for a wave function is the Slater determinant of independent single particle wave functions because it includes uh, automatically the anti-symmetric nature of the many body wave function. So the Slater determinant uh, is expressed by single particle wave functions where all the electrons can be in all possible states and uh, these n factorial uh, combinations is expressed by products which we can be elegantly write in terms of this layer determinant. And if our Hamiltonian does not depend on the spin explicitly, we can write the, the wave function, a single particle wave function, which depends on 
position coordinates and the spin coordinate is a product of a spin independent wave function and a spinner wave function. And with this, I come to the Hartree Fock approximation because in the Hartree Fock approximation, you look now for the best possible slitter determinant in the sense of a, a single particle wave function under constraint that your wave functions, single particle wave functions are uh, normalized for all occupied states. That means you minimize now the uh, expectation value for the slitter determinant with the slitter, uh, with the slitter determinant as wave function with respect to the single particle wave functions under the constraint which you put in by Lagrange parameter that the wave function is normalized. And you minimize uh, this uh, energy, not only according to one electron, but in the, for example, in the case of the uh, CO CO2 molecule, it would be 22 wave function, 22 minimizations for 22 different states. And if you do that, you end up with the Hartree-Fock equation, which consists of the kinetic energy, uh, the uh, external potential, the heart ray uh, potential, which is, uh, is the potential of the uh, electron in the repulsive potential of all the other electrons produced by the charge density distribution of the electrons. And to this uh, charge density contribution belongs also the electrons we are looking at. And then the last uh, term is given by the exchange correlation potential which is given by the uh, pair uh, by uh, state dependent uh, pair potential. Obviously, the pair, pot the, the pair potential, the pair density, the pair density is non-local, and it depends on the states which I'm looking at. So that means, um, um, yeah, and I can express this uh, pair density uh, through the through the wave function, and it looks pretty unwieldy. Obviously, the ex, uh, exchange, call, exchange potential is a potential that acts only on the state of the same spin. And this tells you also that uh, uh, this potential is spin dependent and you can gain energy. And you see immediately, maybe it has some, uh, rel something to say with the emergence of magnetism in solids. And uh, obviously, uh, this uh, pair potential is a, is a little bit difficult to conceive. But what it does is it reminds you at the um, fermionic nature of the wave function. If you have an electron in state R and an electron in uh, position R prime, and they both have the same and uh, the same state, if these electrons approach each other, the probability of meeting. Uh, the probability of meeting is very low. It's basically zero. Uh, this we call the exchange hole. And this exchange hole guarantees now that uh, the Hartree-Fock theory is actually self-interaction free because it cancels exactly for this particular case that electrons are in the same state. And at the same position, it cancels actually against the density. Now, um, you can immediately see how things are continuing. You have the first leader determinant. Now you can have the second leader determinant, the tenth leader determinant. You can have hundreds leader determinants, and you have millions leader of leader determinants. The more wave functions you have, the more wave functions you include, just the more pr uh, um, precise your results will become. And this gives goes basically in the direction of quantum chemistry. But parallel to the, the Hartree theory, which is a wave, and the Hartree Fox theory, which are a wave function based theory, there is also um, uh, at the same time a second theory, um, which is completely different, which do, do, does not dwell on the wave function, but on the density. And this is in the framework of the Thomas Fermi approximation. Um, originating originally from nuclear physics. So you interpret the total energy as a function, a functional of the density. So how do you describe the kinetic energy of electrons 
as part of the function of the uh, of the uh, of the density. Uh, this you can do by taking the, the density dependent kinetic energy of the homogeneous electron gas. So if you have a homogeneous electron gas, your eigenstates uh, will be a wave function. The wave function will be a plane wave. You have the number of plane waves you have. Are a, um, you can occupy all your plane wave waves up to the highest occupied state with the Fermi wave vector. This gives you then finally the kinetic energy. The Fermi wave vector is related to the density of the homogeneous electron gas. And now you go one step further, you say, I am, if, I, if my density is slowly varying, this is the local density approximation. This is, you do the local, local density approximation to the kinetic energy and say locally, what I have derived here, I to take locally for each position R if the way the density is slowly varying. And then you get, uh, so to say, a density distribution, which depends on this, uh, on the power of five third. And this uh, you can add now to the, uh, the, the in the action of the density with the external potential and with the uh, heart rate, um, with the heart rate energy. And so you have a density functional um, of the density functional, which you can minimize with respect to this density and you get the density uh, and differential equation for the density distribution, which you can then solve. Here's an example. I have solved it for this argon atom. And you see here um, the density distribution in the Hartree approximation. You see of a kind of a shell structure, which is totally lost in the, ca in the case of Thomas Fermi theory. In the Thomas Fermi theory, you get something like mean field. You get a much too long tail. And the reason why you lost this shell structure is because the kinetic energy, which is a large number in the atoms, um, is not well reproduced by this local density approximation to the kinetic energy. Uh, but it is, uh, so to say, a completely parallel direction in solid state physics to uh, the wave function theory. And then in 1964, with the paper of Hohenberg and Cohn, Hohen they established now the density as the basic variable in quantum mechanics. Known is that the external potential and the number of electrons determine uniquely the charge density n. But what uh, the theorem one of Hohenberg and Cohn says, you can invert that statement. For a given external potential, the ground state properties of a system are uniquely determined by the electron density alone. And they are functionals of the density. The so second theorem, which says, says that the exact ground state density minimizes the energy functional. Both of these can be proven. So what you know is you have a potential. And if you solve the Schrodinger equation, you get a wave function to this given potential. And if you take the square of this wave function and you sum up over all occupied state, you get basically the density. So if you think about it, you have a mapping of the potential to the wave function and from the wave function to the density, or you can construct a mapping G, which constructs the, which maps surjectively the potential um, onto the density. And what Hohenberg and Cohn theorem says is G is basically invertible. So how does the proof works? It's by reduces an absurdum. Now it is there are nicer proofs available, for example, from Levy, but I'm not going to into it. So basically I assume a contradiction. Uh, I'm saying that two different wave functions, psi and psi prime, map into the same density. So I'm assuming that I have a potential, a system with potential V, a system with potential V prime, which has the wave function psi prime and the energy E prime. And I have to show that different wave functions map onto different densities. 
but I make the assumption that they move to one density. So I'm looking for the energy as expectation value for system one, uh, the Hamiltonian one to uh, the wave function one. But if I replace in the system one, um, the wave function by the wave function of uh, system two, then the energy cannot be optimal. According to Rayleigh Ritz, it is, has a higher energy. And I can rewrite now the Hamiltonian H by the Hamiltonian uh, adding the system two and subtracting the system two. And since the difference between the system one and system two is only the difference in the potential one and two, I can now write the total energy of the system one, which has the energy E in terms of the energy of the system E prime and the difference between the potential of the system uh, one and two and the density two. And I can do exactly the same story uh, for, this, for the second uh, system, which is then given by the energy uh, E, the density N and the difference between the potential of system two and one. See, this is exactly the opposite sign as this one. And if I assume now that I map to the same density, which I assume here, then I can replace this density and this density by the same density. I can take, I can add one and two and see that the energy E, uh, the energy of system one and system two is smaller than the system, uh, the energy of system one and the system two. But this is a contradiction. So that means basically I can construct a universal functional. So I have the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy, um, the interaction energy, electron-electron interaction and uh, the uh, potential. And um, um, I can separate now um, the system dependent external potential here. And what's remaining here is a, a functional I call it the universal functional. And this universal functional uh, is basic, is, is a functional which is universal. It is the same for all systems uh, where the particles interact with the other by the Coulomb interaction W. Um, according to uh, uh, according to uh, theorem two, um, um, the ground state density minimizes this functional. That means if I don't have if I don't have a density, which is the ground state density, then um, the energy is higher than the ground state density. The proof is by construction and the proof is rather simple. So maybe I don't want to spend much time on this proof, uh, but basically what it is, is the, the density, uh, if you know the density, you know the potential. And if you know the potential, you can solve the Schrodinger equation. So I have solved the, imagine I have solved the Schrodinger equation um, and I have the wave function as function of the density then basically you have the energy with respect to the potential V. And if the density which I have is not the ground state density, then the wave function is not a true wave function. The wave function which I assume is the ground state density is not the wave function um, of the true ground state density. And therefore, um, the expectation value is higher than the ground state expectation value according to really rates. But if I have the, the same, if I have the ground state density, then the ground state wave function to the ground state density is the, ex the correct uh, wave function to this particular potential. And therefore I reach exactly the ground state energy. So hence um, um, the ground state energy and the ground state density can be obtained by an energy minimization process because you come always from above. Um, 
so far, everything is very nice. Um, what people often do not appreciate is how important it is to have an existence uh, criterion. And this existence criterion was given to us by uh, the uh, Hohenberg Cohen theorem one and two, because if you know there is a gold mine, you will find the gold mine. And here I show you how to find the gold mine in the words of Kohn Shem means um, um, the Kohn, uh, I, I'm leading you to Kohn Shem equations, which gives you an, uh, a path to, to find an, uh, to, to uh, give an explicit form of this functional. And this we called, call, call uh, the cone shem density function theory. And this cone shem density function theory is the theory which 99% of all of us use when we mean density function theory. So towards the practical scheme, imagine you have a system without interaction. If you have a system without interaction, your universe functions depends only on the kinetic energy. And uh, it turns out that this later determinant of non-interacting particles uh, is exactly the, the solution to this um, uh, functional form, to this universal functional. That means we have an exact solution of this uh, functional in the limit of no, no interacting functionals. And this now we use, uh, this uh, idea of this non-interaction functional, we use actually to establish uh, a practical density functional. So um, we assume, the, the central idea is, we assume there exists a potential, and this potential will exist, which is the Kohn-Shem potential, um, is an effective potential in which the interacting electron behave as non-interacting non electrons, but, uh, if, uh, but at the end, having the same ground state density as the interacting system. So we write the, uh, the, the, the energy functional, the energy as function of the density, as the energy of the kinetic energy of the non-interacting system, the density with the external system, the heart rate term, and something which we do not know correctly, but some rest, which is uh, which contains the exchange interactions, and the correction of the uh, to the kinetic energy um, of the interacting system, which is correcting the energy to the the non-interacting, kinetic energy of the non-interacting system. So the variation of this um, energy with respect to the density uh, gives now a term, which is the kinetic energy variation and the variation to a uh, external potential. And this external potential is the cone shem potential. It is external because the electrons in this potential are non-interacting, which consists of the true external potential, the heart rate potential, and the exchange correlation potential, which is the variation of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the density. So our cone shem equation, it consists of, of the kinetic energy, the cone shem potential. The cone shem potential depends on the density. That means um, we have to solve this problem self consistently. So maybe we guess a cone shem potential. From the uh, cone shem potential, we get the cone shem orbitals and the cone shem uh, energy parameters. The square of this density uh, gives us uh, the square of the orbitals, cone shem orbitals, gives us the, the density. And this we can do then self-consistently. If you have the density, you can get the, uh, the Kohn-Shem potential and so on. So for this uh, exchange correlation energy here on the exchange correlation potential here, we have to find uh, approximations. And the great power of the density function theory is that 
relatively simple approximations are relatively powerful. I would like uh, to, to give some uh, small cautions. Um, so the comb gem orbitals as such has no physical medium, meaning except as a vehicle to construct the density. And this density is the exact density of the interacting system. In particular, the Slater type orbitals has, have, uh, uh, cannot be taken as an approximation to the many body wave function. Likewise, uh, these orbital energies, epsilon i, are actually uh, Lagrange parameters and have no physical meaning. Of course, we will learn that in some, in some, to some extension, they have a physical meaning. For example, in terms of Koopman's theorem or in terms of other approximations. The exchange correlate uh, for the exchange correlation potential, we have kind of a um, for the exchange correlation approximation to the uh, exchange correlation energy, we have kind of a Jacobs letter in the sense of uh, uh, in the spirit of uh, uh, the fact that the more in a wave function based method, the more wave functions you have taken into account, most likely um, the uh, energy becomes better. A priori, it is not so in density function theory. But in general, what we see is um, we have different levels. For example, the density, functions which depend on density, like a local density approximation, function which depends on the density on, and the gradient of the density, like the generalized gradient approximation. This function is now good, good enough and since we have these functions, material science has adopted density functional theory. Of course, a natural step would be to take the, the second derivative, but it turns out that the second derivative to the density is often very unstable. So we take actually the kinetic energy density, and this leads to the meta GGAs. And a big breakthrough, which basically opened density functional theory for the field of chemistry, are the uh, hybrid functionals, hybrid GGAs like V3 lip, because they guarantee kilocalorie per mole accuracy, which is needed, uh, which is also, um, which is needed in chemistry and often called chemical accuracy. More you will learn about this in the lecture by Gustav Bielmeier on Thursday. So in summary, um, we have, a cone gem, we have the cone gem standard model, which is the computational approach in physics, chemistry, nanoscience, material science, biophysics, mineralogy, and geology. The total energy depends on the density, plus external parameters like the lattice constant, atom positions, magnetization directions. The variation of this energy with respect to the density gives us the cone gem equations, which are secular equations. The solution of the secular equations are cone gem orbitals and cone gem energies. The, the meaning of these cone gem orbitals are to construct the density. And it, the, with the density, we can construct the, the, the cone gem uh, Hamiltonian or the cone gem equations. And therefore, we have to solve this uh, self consistently. So we have mapped the quantum mechanical many, many body problem to a, a nonlinear. Uh, to the non to a nonlinear equation, which is the cone gem equation of single particle physics. Um, the computational uh, time scales roughly with the cubic with the number of atoms, or cubic with the number of volumes, and cube cubic in the position. The the theory is extremely um, successful. Last year, we have published 30,000 papers with the density function theory worldwide. You see the distribution. Um, the chemistry is large, material science is large. Chemistry uses typically uh, hybrid functionals. Material science uses use typically uh, gradient, uh, gradient approximations. Nowadays, you have so many functionals that sometimes you need to worry which function I should use for which purpose. 
The large number of people uh, is also a consequence that computing became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So the computing the, uh, the speed of the computers uh, increase uh, exponentially with time. Uh, we are reaching now the pre-exascale and exascale uh, 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 performance. A computation that took one year in 1989 takes now one second in the 2018. So we have a 30 million fold increase in one generation of people. This enables a huge uh, uh, throughput capacity, which doubles every year, uh, um, every, uh, every, 40 month, every 14 months. And uh, so we're aiming today towards larger systems more accuracy concerns electron correlations, longer dynamical simulations, atomistic domain, uh, uh, molecular dynamics or spin dynamics. I discussed in the lecture basically the static and dynamical properties related to DFT, uh, relating DFT to the quantum space. There's a second big field, which is the excitations using GW or time dependent density function theory. And there's also transport, uh, where, for example, you can relate uh, to the Kubo theory. And these are provide very different computational challenges. We deal also with the large chemical phase space. space. So uh, the, the, the combinatorics of the materials, uh, minerals, and so on is so large that a human being alone cannot uh, probably search could study all this uh, large phase space. So we move into autonomous high throughput computing plus data informatics. And uh, as a last thing uh, to keep in mind this lecture, so we do cone gem density function theory. Cone gem means a useful way to write down the unknown function in terms of a uh, non-interacting sin single electron wave functions. The density means everything can be expressed by uh, electron densities. And density functional means there is, exists a one-to-one -one mapping between the energy or the potential and the density. So with this, I thank you very much and really enjoy the workshop.